beautiful people. More life, more blessings. Welcome back to another episode of the Do It For The Love podcast. I'm your host, Eric Buddy Davis. You know, my co-host is in the building with me, South Spitfire. In the case, you know, in case you was wondering, we're feeling good, feeling great. Feeling great, feeling good. We hope you are too. So you know we're gonna be starting it off with that checking your temperature, bud. So still bud member. Yes, it is. Still yes, it bud is. Bud member, right around the corner from the B day. You are right. Checking you are your ready. temperature. How you feeling after the holiday? I feel lovely, my brother. You know, more life, more blessings, as I already said. But um, it feels good, man. Going into thirty six, um, I am having a little event for myself. Undisclosed location. So, uh, you know, those who need to know will know, and those who don't, just yeah. watch the Instagram. And by the time this come out, it's going to be done for, so... You're all right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah but I feel good, though, man. You know, everything's going good at work. Everything's going good with the family, man. You know, so nothing uh, to complain about. Life is great. How about yourself? Feeling thankful, man. It's always good to see family after the holidays and uh, getting really prepared to end off this year strong. Uh, Game planning, still working, setting up projects for the early fall, Stay early working. spring, going into the summer. So I'm, I'm hype, man. Absolutely. So as you know, Mr. Spitfire stays hot, stay busy, stay working. So um, we're going to get straight into it, man. Tonight's topic is going to be for the love of inspiration. So what do you do to stay inspired? What inspires you? How do you stay on top of the things that inspire you? I know a lot of people love to do, throw vision board parties. A lot of other people use social media, different type of pages. In this day and age, you know, it's a hundred different motivational pages, a lot of different avenues that people draw inspiration from. But at the same time, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, X, those same places can make people feel not inspired. Because depending on what you might have studied in school, or depending on what you do for a living, you see all your friends taking vacations, hitting the tropics, doing stuff that you may not can afford. It may, it may force you to take a social media break, which could then be less inspiring, and then you end up doing nothing, or you find stagnation. So I want to focus on that, my brother. How will you stay inspired, or what inspires you? Well, <clears throat> touching on what you just said, like social media, right? In, in today's world, there's so much toxicity mm-hmm. on social media and things that could bring you down. You have to really make sure that you keying in on the people that inspire you. I'm really inspired by local leaders and okay. people that I know that really got boots on the ground, really making a difference in the community. I'm inspired by people that do the same work that I do. Remember I mentioned uh, Chuck Styles uh, the artist in the very first episode. So when I see artists who are doing things that's just unbelievable or you know amazed at the type of class that they have those are people that inspire me and then I got my family members too who may not be superstars or athletes but going through the daily hustle and the grind and, and you know whether it's raising kids or working two jobs like those people inspire me and and you know I'm always motivated by them what about you man it's crazy you hit the spectrum but I feel like for me it came in different spurts I feel like growing up, loving entertainment, you know me, like I said, I'm always the person that want to read Us Weekly. I was always into music, I was always into film. So my inspirations growing up was always an artist. I know it's not popular opinion to say his name now, but Puffy, being the person that could throw a party at the same time, run a label, and at the same time, for whatever reason, everybody seemed to gravitate to. Being somebody now like a Dave Chappelle or Kevin Hart, I used to only find inspiration in celebrity. Because I felt like I had to get out of Annapolis or out of Maryland to feel like I'm doing something or I'm accomplished. But then as I grew older, graduated school, and started coaching youth sports, I started to see that OJ, my old uh, Annapolis Crusaders football coach, was an inspiration. Because he brought me back in coaching. My man Delray Johnson, somebody that dedicates all his free time to coaching youth sports. His two children now in their 20s, one still a teenager about to enter high school, actually in high school, that's all he does. And now he gets to sit in the stands and watch them. So that's an inspiration to me. I've told you before, I'll tell you a million more times. You, building this show with you, watching your day-to-day, bro, you're an inspiration because you're one of the few friends I know that you're not waiting on a company or organization to pay you. You're waiting on payments, but it's normally the work that you created, contracts you created. So that's an inspiration to get out of the program of normal nine-to-fives and all that. And I'm not knocking nine-to-fives at all. I have one that I go to Monday through Friday. But at the same time, that's an inspiration to know you can get to the place where you're your own business. Yeah. So all of those things inspire me. And like you said, family, my mom, to get to the level she got to without going to college. 
Um, my dad, now going to college, worked at the Naval Academy, leader of custodial work for years, and he transitioned that work outside of it. So all of those things I find inspiration in. And, um, and I also find inspiration in things that people make a set of negative. Like when I see things that I find maybe can be a gap, that if I guarantee one conversation will bring them people closer together, that inspires me to be able to get in rooms where my voice can matter and do things like graduated from Northwestern, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion um, certificate that I got. Just learning how other people break barriers and get to different spaces. Um, so yeah, that's like a few of the things that inspire me. And then on, on the topic of inspiration and family, you know, I've been in situations and seen other people be in situations where family can be less in, inspiring at times and almost pull you down to where you're not believing in yourself. So I appreciate friends like you because even when I'm venting to you, telling you some negative things. You always like it's, it's good. It's a part of it. Like Absolutely. bounce back. You know what I mean. So you gotta have supportive people to be inspired as well. Gotcha. Shout out to Jay Z's uncle. We would have never got the whole we got if you believed in your nephew. <laughs> we appreciate you, my brother. The love, of, the love for God. So, um, anything else you'd like to speak on? Anything inspirational that you think uh, uh, super, stand out? Yeah, it's super inspiring that we got a guest today that mm. I feel like, in my opinion, epitomizes the word inspire, you know what I mean? And uh, it's going to be exciting to share his story with y'all and hopefully you inspired by today's episode. Absolutely, but before we get into our guest, that's the perfect segue alley-oop into our sponsor highlight for this episode. Who we got? So for this Do It For The Love podcast episode, we are going to highlight the copious firm. They started out selling windows and doors at Home Depot. Now they're selling the entire house. When your perspective changes, so will you and everything you do. Follow their real estate company at the underscore copious. For those who don't have a Webster dictionary, that is K-O-P-I-U-O-U-S underscore firm, F-I-R-M. And I want to send a special shout out to their CEO, my brother Lamar Sims, a.k.a. The Architect. This brother is known for manifesting authentic realities, so just call him Mar. He is a realtor, and you can take ownership with his help. Do yourself a service and take ownership. And shout out to Lamar, man. He's been supporting me and, you know, the Keep It Raw family and all of the clothing that I've dropped. He's always found a way to support me in my life. So shout out to him, man. Absolutely, man. Special shout out. I'm glad you spelled that out because I definitely <laughs> Oh, man. Listen, I had to check myself and I spelled it out myself. I definitely fact checked that. But, uh, yeah, so that's pretty much just want to send a special shout out to them. And I think it's time, man. I think it's time that we bring on our first episode of the Door for the Live podcast. Today, we have author, nonprofit executive director, business owner, motivational speaker, Mr. Wesley Hawkins. Wesley is CEO of the Nolita Project. So, anything you want to add before we bring our brother into the spotlight? I mean, this, this brother, just by reading up on him and, you know, glancing at his book, he has a lot of, he wears a lot of hats um, and has one big voice. You know, he's a voice of the streets, um, educated, like Buddy said, real estate investor. I mean, I'm just anxious to really get into your story, man. Go ahead and tell us if there's anything that we missed out on your accolades or your titles. <laughs> Who is Wesley Hawkins? Who is Wesley Hawkins? Baltimore native. Um, born and raised East Baltimore. I'm just, you know, a person that believes in motivating, inspiring, and uplifting your people. Okay. Um, we've been through a lot of different things throughout the history of what people go through in America as being black and brown men and women. So I, I feel like a lot of us need to step up at a high level and put in that work on the ground. So that's just something that I do. Absolutely, absolutely. So speaking of the things that you do, I'd rather you tell the people other than we tell the people. So what is it that Wesley Hawkins does? I know I already said the No Leader Project, but in your order, however, you want to tell them a little bit about the what it is that you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to share with our audience. So what's the No Leader Project? The No Leader Project is a nonprofit that I founded and created um, first in 2012 um, is when I came up with the idea of what I wanted to do. How I first started was I used to go out on a corner in East Baltimore and mentor and tutor and talk to kids before they went to school. Okay. So I would get up every morning around like go out there like 6, 6.30 just to talk to the kids that was going to school because there was a lot of how we grew up, it's, it's a lot of crime and violence in our communities and neighborhoods. And I, I, I realized that a lot of the times you got to get to the youth before they get caught in the streets. Mm -hmm. So I used to talk to the kids before they went to the school. And that went from them 
like liking and falling in love with what I was doing. So the schools and the parents started to hear about who I was. Like, who this young man out here helping out kids? Right. So the schools reached out to me, wanted me to come into the schools and be able to help with their students that they considered high risk. But once I got there, they was like, whoa, you don't have no particular program or curriculum. So from there, I, I only knew I wanted to do the work. Got it. But I didn't know where it was going to take me, and I didn't know what it consisted of. So at the time, I didn't know what a nonprofit was. I didn't know what a 501c3 status meant. That's I didn't cool. know what curriculum development and all that stuff. I just knew I wanted to do the work of helping my community, helping save lives, helping the youth. So once they started to hear about me, and I got to the door and realized it was tape in front of me mm -hmm. to stop me from being able to do that work. Now it's like, oh no, I need to figure out how to get past the next this this tape and get to the next level. Gotcha. So I um I was contacted by a couple of professors and people in the community who loved what I was doing and they actually started to show me and teach me the process. Mm -hmm. So I started to develop and write and create my own curriculum with the support and help of other professors and leaders in the community. Um, and it would help me kind of like put it together. Okay. I knew what I wanted to look like, so I would build out the framework and all the writing and all the work, and they would teach me and show me how you put it together. And in 2014, I started in 2012, and 2014, I had a lot of the work already created, but it wasn't properly packaged. Okay. And what, what really put the fire to me was I already knew what I wanted to do as far as changing the lives in the community. But my mother passed away from drug overdose in 2014. Sorry. And at the end of 2014, when my mom passed, I realized at this point, I can't, you know, be held up no more. It's no more thinking. It's just doing. So I put my package together, um, sent it out, got it cleaned up and stuff like that, and submitted everything that I could submit. Got it returned a couple of times. Um, and then I finally became a 501c3 organization in 2016. But I was already doing the work in 2012, so I got accounted for a lot of that time. Okay. Um, and what did that lead to? It led to me being able to provide programming in different schools around Baltimore City. So we do tutoring, mentoring, um, we did temporary housing, um, just a holistic approach of how to help the student. And what does that mean? If they need food, we've supplied it. If they need clothes, if they need a shelter, if they need any type of support to help that student be successful, that's what we tried to provide. But during my journey and my path, I realized that sometimes when you're dealing with a child, it's not just the child that you need to help. It's the mother that they're living with. It's the grandmother that's raised. Foundation. It's the aunt. It's the home. See, a lot of the times we, we don't realize how a lot of the students and these youth and these kids are coming from unbalanced, unstable, and um, lack of uh, resources, style of environments. And when you have a child that's growing up like that, mm -hmm. how do you expect them to be able to come to school and function? How do you expect this child to come to school, be able to read, write, and count, and provide any type of test scores or any type of proficient schooling when, when they go at home to a father that may be incarcerated, a father that may be deceased, or a father may, that may not be in the picture, or a mother that is getting high, or a mother that's working three or four jobs. Or you might have a mother that have a really good job, but she's gone so much because she's working, because she's holding down so much of the fort herself, right. and now there's nobody to share those duties with. It's still boy. Right. So my program, we decided to create different pillars within the program of how to help the family. Because sometimes it's bigger than the child, it's just the whole household. Mm -hmm. So... Um, uh, that's, that's just a lot of the work that I do with working with the community. I've been on the ground as far as activists when things that we need to stand up and speak on that's going on in the community. I use my voice and my education, my experience, my connections, and my leadership just to try to be that voice to speak on this is wrong, right. this is what we need, or this is what we try to need to do to figure out what we need. Right. right? Stepping back a little bit, you know, going back to the you know, early beginnings and speaking about the voice. Walk us through what some of them conversations look like in the mornings with the kids. I mean, not too much detail, but just walk us through like some of the conversations you were here and how have they elevated up to you actually forming the 501c3. So, honestly, when I first went out there, you got to build a relationship. 
You got to be consistent. You got to let them know you're serious. You got to let them know where you're from. A lot of the young kids, especially high school, middle school kids too, but high school kids, they attach you. You feel what I'm saying? They want to know what cloth you're from. They want to know what hood you're from. They want to know where you're from. If you're from Baltimore, what part? They'll question you. They'll ask you. So once you build that relationship and you be consistent and you just show them you had to actually try to help them in some type of way or you can connect with them or relate to them, then they'll start to open up right. their, their minds, their hearts, and let those walls down. Right? So for me, it just was letting them know I'm from here, born and raised. Grew up in East Baltimore. If you've been homeless before, I can relate to you because I've been there. Mm -hmm. If you've been shot or stabbed, I can relate because I've been there. If you have drug addict parents or parents that have been incarcerated, I can relate because I've been there. If you have parents or if you've been in foster care, I can relate because I've been there. But not only can I relate to you in that aspect of life where we went through so much trauma and struggle, I can also relate to how to show you and teach you how to be successful. Right? So once you open up to them and show them, no, I ain't coming here just trying to preach to you like I'm better than you. I'm coming here letting you know these things that you may or may not have experienced or may have friends or family members that experienced, I've been through it. Right. But I've also lived through it and reached high levels of success. So now how can I actually relate to you? And a relatability piece allows people to open up and let you know like, damn, hey, you'll get it. Right. You feel what I'm saying? So once you get past that point, then now you can start showing them, okay, this is how you start to grow, develop, and build, and get better from a place where a lot of people, and I'm not saying this in the way of trying to say other people not doing great work, because we have a, a lot of amazing people doing great work, but where a lot of the times where students and families and people shut down is when you just come straight in the door telling them what they're doing wrong. They my job. When you come straight in the door, That's a fact. letting them feel like who they are or what they are, it's not valued, or it's beneath you, or it's lower than you. You got to let them know where you're from, or how much you care, or what you experience. So, because you got to relate to the person. Mm -hmm. If you can't relate to me in no type of way, a lot of the times, it don't matter how successful you are, they not trying to hear what you're saying. And I'm saying that because I was like that as, as a young man, right? Mm -hmm. If you ain't grabbed my mind at a certain space, I'm like, man, I might want to hear right. that. You know what I'm saying? So on that piece... Um, I would just relate to them, brother, in, in, in real-life fashion of what they're going through in the streets, what they're going through in school, what they may be going through in their home, what they're going through in the community, what they're experiencing on the bus ride, what they experience when they walk down their block. Just relate to their everyday life, and then I built from there. Gotcha. So, moving past that, when we bring on guests, the way we like to flow with it is the who, which we feel like you answer very thoroughly, along with the what. I also feel like you might have answered the when, but I want to pull something from what you just said, speaking of homelessness, and reading up on another initiative that you had called the Gateway Project. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask, when, on top of your mom's passing, on top of already knowing what you wanted to put together, but obviously having to rebrand it, piece it all together, and actually just putting it all in action, when did you know that like that initiative, specifically more so the Gateway Project, because I would love for you to speak on that. When did you know the impact that that could have, and when did that initially start? Um, the Gateway Project is a actually is a new project okay. that my organization has started to develop and build and okay. work on. Because again, it goes back into working with the whole family. I've been doing this work for over a decade now, and I realized a lot of these family members again need help in a lot of different ways. And in Merlin, just to get some numbers in Merlin, because I'm from Baltimore, to but say I speak on Merlin. In, Mer in Merlin, black Americans only make up 29% of the population of people who live here, right? Okay. So if you talk more every city or, 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 or county that's in Merlin, we make up 29% of that. Okay. However, the prison, the jail, the probation, people who are in the system, we make up 72% of the population of people in Merlin that consist of the prisons, the jails, the youth detention centers, and people who are on parole and probation. 
we make we 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 are closer to seventy three percent than we are fifty or thirty. So if you know things about mathematics or numbers and right. you can break that down and really visualize that and consciously literally think about that, you only make up twenty nine percent of the whole population of the people who live in that state. But those prisons and jails that are in that state, you make up seventy two percent of that. So the percentage that's free is you feel what I'm saying? Cool. It's is 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 a major issue. So you telling me that we are fighting at such a high level, but not only are we fighting against poverty, not only are we dealing with high levels of crime, not only are we dealing with low um low uh proficient schools and things like that, you also have to deal with the system of mass incarceration, over policing and things like that. So while you have so many things that's going against your people, you are already trying to fight a really extreme uphill battle. It's right. so many things that's against you, right? So when you add in the fact that in our culture we have allowed the negative things become the top priority of what's cool. Absolutely. You feel what I'm saying? We already have systematic oppression and systematic things and systematic racism and stereotypes and, 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 and prejudgment. We already face those things just being born a black man or a black woman from the system. But now you tell me in a community or a culture that we've grown up and we raise a family and kids and a young man that has two parents, a young man that can read, write, and count. A young man that's smart, we make him seem like he's the cool bug. We make it seem like he's the one who's not cool. Christian. But the young man that can't read, the young man that's making the classroom be disrupted, the young man that's making outbursts or fighting on people or harming ones, we popularize that's that young cool man. Kid. Right? So my mindset is how do we start to change of what's cool? So within the program or the Gateway Project, we work with um, individuals coming home from prison okay. with children between the ages of 5 and 24, okay. right? So what does that look like and what does that mean? Not only are we going to have a case manager set up for the mother or father that's coming home from incarceration to help them get reacclimated with life and get set up, meaning if they need therapy, we can refer them there. If they need... <clears throat> excuse me. I'm good. If they need... Uh, Workforce development right. or any type of career or job, we can look in our network and refer them. If they're looking for houses, refer those places, right? If they need some type of transportation, help provide services for that. So it's a whole holistic approach of how can we help this individual come home from prison or incarceration to be um, welcomed back into society and help to guide that. But if you have a child, which is a major piece to that, between the ages of 5 and 24, how can we help provide services for that child on an educational piece, mm -hmm. on a tutoring piece, on a mentor piece, on a therapeutic piece, on a holistic approach of the family, mm -hmm. right? So that was um, the thinking with creating the Gateway Project. And the Gateway Project, again, um, something that we have newly um, structured and built out because the No Leader Project is the main foundation of the organization. Right. And the No Leader Project is the piece that strictly works with youth that are in the school system that are struggling at a high level. Gotcha. Then we started to accept other students because first we came to the schools just working with students that had high needs. But the students loved it so much that all oh, the young girls, first we were focusing just on young men. The young girls started to hear about what we was doing. They were like, oh my dogs, we need this too. And they want to be a part. And then students that don't even have those same needs, they started to love what they hear and saw with the leadership and the programming. Now they want to be a part, okay. right? So we have this program that we provide those things um, during and at the school. So from that, that vision and that thinking, I saw a high, a high need that a lot of these children, their parents are incarcerated. A lot of these children, their parents are either coming home or still have years. And, and, and within the system. So I said, well, how can we be a part of that? So that's why the Gateway Project was something that was created from the No Leader Project. I just want to commend you before we move into our next segment with you. I just want to commend you on that because not only is your approach dope when you sent over your information, I love the fact that you use words like holistic approach. And I like the fact even tonight when you talk about when someone asks the question of how, what are the things you may say in the morning, the fact that you don't try to focus on what they lack. 
I think too many times in life people focus on our lack, especially in our community. We focus on lack more than we focus on gain. Mm -hmm. We focus on that more than things that can grow on a person. We focus on where it's at. Like if you're already not good at math, we don't think about how we can make you better. We just look at the fact that you're not good right. at it. So um, I just appreciate your whole approach. Uh, so anything else you want to say before we move into right? I just want to make questions? sure that we get the, the viewers tapped in on, on your book. I know we'll probably get a question where you can give us a little bit more detail about it, but. You know, the book is here, Dear No Leader, The Evolution of an Addict Son. Mm -hmm. And that leads me with one more question about the, the winning, right? Me, myself, being also an addict son, you know, we could at times feel like the lost forgotten child and, and go through all of these things. During your story and your journey, when was that defining moment for you when all that you went through, you found out your purpose? Mm -hmm. Like, what was that, that one, that defining moment for you? That gets deep for me. Um, so my book is called Dear Nolita. Nolita is my mother's name, N-O-L-I-T-A. And the reason why I titled my book Dear Nolita, because I wanted to make sure that while I'm speaking to my audience, I'm also speaking to my mother. Right? So it's Dear Nolita. The second piece is called The Evolution of an Addict Son. What does evolution mean? To change, to grow, to evolve. Right. So I want people to understand just the title alone is Dear No Leader, The Evolution of an Addict Son. And the reason why I titled that is because I come from two drug addict parents. Um, my mother was a drug addict. My father is a drug addict. But my mother lost her life and passed away from drug overdose. So for me, growing up as a child with two drug addict parents, it's high levels of trauma, high levels of abuse, Lack of food, lack of resources, lack of stability, lack of education, lack of knowledge. It's just a lack of certain things that most children that grow up in the conditions that I did never make it to a higher level of success. Talk to them. Right? So for me, it was imperative to be able to, to do the work that I do, mm -hmm. but also to be able to put it in writing. It's also video form and stuff like that. So when you say, when was my when? Yeah, it was, it was, it was, man, a lot of different moments during my life that I started to see that actually had changed me in different ways. So, I, 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 like I said, I grew up in East Baltimore, and when I was a child, we lived in a lot of abandoned houses because my mother didn't maintain a regular working job. So, so we would move around to abandoned houses, and she would clean them up, and we we would call them abandoned miniums, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and from the age of five all the way up until 13, I was taught about the streets and, and drugs and, and hustling from my mother, right? So I started, I had my own block and own team and own crew um, in East Baltimore when I was 13 years old because I had started at a young age. So I moved up in the ranks really young. Um, and my mom took advantage of that. I could fight really well when I was young and she took advantage of that. So when I was young, the focal point was not me take care, I'm sorry, not my mom take care of me, but it was more so like me take care of my mom. Mm -hmm. So I was more of a parent to my mom than she was to me because she was sick, right? So when I was 13, um, had my own block, a dude that served a, a, a bunch of time in prison, um, which I can't disclose, he came home. Um, and he was like, y'all letting this young nigga run this block. This is my block. Me and my best friend, we was on the corner. It was a store, corner store on the block. He pulled out a 40, blew my best friend brains out in broad daylight, pointed the gun towards me. I hit his hand down. He shot me in my right shoulder. When he shot me in my right shoulder, he realized he didn't, like, get me all the way, and he ran it off. So, um, at the age of 13, I had got shot and almost died because in the, in the hood, sometimes, our communities want to cover stuff up, and the proper things didn't take place when I was a child. Um, so, what I mean by that, instead of me getting rushed to the hospital, they tried to do the neighborhood doctor healing mm -hmm. type stuff, right? So, took a, took me as a young man, child, 13, threw me in the tub, pouring alcohol on me, doing all this stuff, trying to stuff and pack my shoulder. I'm screaming, crying. They got the thing in my mouth. All type of stuff that you people might see on movies. Right. Well, right. these ideas come from real places, and I'm one of those children that live through that. So, me losing my best friend to the streets started to spark something in me. But it was 50-50. It, it kind of made me more angry. 
more frustrated, made me kind of hate certain things, but it also gave me peace, like, yo, I had a second chance, I ain't die, so it kind of made me want to change. I would say that was one of my first moments in my life where life kind of changed and I wanted to change, but it didn't click yet. Mm -hmm. I was still engulfed in, you know, the street. And my mom lost all our kids. I'm trying to speed up to the change the moment. My mm -hmm. mom lost all our kids when I was 13, and we got split up. We you all said most kids. Can you say how many? Well, at the time, it was um, it was seven of us at the time. Um, she eventually had 11 children all together, but at the time, it was seven of us that had all lived together, and we went to foster care. Got it. Um, my other siblings, I'm the only child between my mother and my father. My other siblings went to went with their fathers. Their father came and got them. Um, because both of my parents was in the street, I went into the system, so I became a foster child. Um, got passed around for about the first six months to a year, and then I eventually got with one of my aunts. Her being able to, God fear a woman, had four of her own kids. They was in college, and I'm sorry, they was in school. The oldest one was in college. She taught them certain things about life. So even though she was a single parent mother, me going from East Baltimore, living in the hood, banded houses, trash everywhere, the gutter life, to now I want to Baltimore County, it's, it's grass, kids going to school, buses picking you up, they hold you accountable. New world. It gave, it was a, what you call a shell shock. It was a culture shock for me. I never had seen or experienced that. You feel what I'm saying? That was the second thing. But what really woke me up and made me change was, I was in my early 20s. I was still hustling. Um, I was about 22. And one of my sisters was in the hospital. And um, she was, you know, what she called self mutilation. Got it. Cutting herself. Mm -hmm. And the only thing she was asking for, she was like, I want to see my mom, I want to see my mom. Right. So I left the hospital where she was admitted at. I went to go get my mother. But I knew where my mother was at because that's where she always would be at. You know, we, we, she still lived in the hood. Um, on North Avenue down the street from Coppin. If anybody from Baltimore or visit Baltimore and you know where Coppin at, Coppin is a good school, but it's right in the middle of the hood. Um, so my mom was on West North Avenue down the street from Coppin between like Poppy Grove and stuff like that. So, excuse me. Good. I, um, I rolled up the block, everybody around that knew me. At the time I had a flashy um, car, I had, um, I had a uh, G35 Affinity, big wheels, loud pipes and everything. So they hit me coming out the block. My mother know I hold her accountable. So she saw me. She got off. And she ran into this drug house. So I parked my car on the corner. And I'm like, yo, ain't no no go. That's my mother named Nolita. But she known in the hood as no no. So I'm like, yo, ain't no no just go. They like, man, we ain't getting in that shit with you and your mother. I'm like, yo, where my mother just go? So I saw my mother at the time, husband. His name was um, Heavy, and uh, that was my little brother's father, my youngest brother's father. I seen him serving, so I brought probably about three, four doors up. I'm like, Heavy, where no, no? He like, man, ain't nobody doing that shit with you and your mother, man, ain't nobody getting into that. So he proceeds to serve some pills in front of me. My sister in the hospital, my mother died off. You ignore me, I'm heated now. You feel what I'm saying? I'm still young, 22. I smacked the pills out of his hand, stomped him. I need where my mother at. So he used to be real known around the neighborhood around there. But it's one of those things where you go from being one of the guys to using your own supply. Mm -hmm. So now you're a fiend. You follow. feel what I'm saying? You're a follow. So he's serving for some young dudes in the in the area. Little young dudes come, they watch him cross the street, they see what happened, they come like, man, nigga, we know who you are, niggas ain't got time for that shit. That's our money. You know what I'm saying? So that turned to a whole scene. I'm out there talking my shit, cause I know everybody. We get into a fight. I'm fighting heavy and the two young dudes. <laughs> and again, I'm known for fighting. So for me, I'm with it. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm with it. I come from Mac Lord's gym. I, I grew up boxing in Baltimore. So mm. I, I, I'm out there. We get it. So it's all three of us, but it's, it's me against three yeah, dudes. So it's like I'm doing, I'm doing my thing, but right. it's three. You know what I'm saying? So. Exactly. Clothes get ripped up, bloody everything. So the dude that ran the block around there, pulled down the street and was like, yo, cut that shit out, y'all making it hot. This was a life-changing moment in my life. 
and I still like think about it to this day. He came down, he made us stop fighting. OG around the block. He tell me he like shorty. Been watching you since you was young. I love you. He said, you don't make it hot around here. He was like, yo, go get no no, cause shorty willing to die for his mother. And I can't have that shit happen around here. Fuck my money up. So they go get my mother out of the drug house. He like, no no, your son around here going crazy. Get in that car. So a mother. And this, what hurt is, my mother was a beautiful woman, inside and outside, like aesthetically, all of that. And, but those drugs, y'all know what it do to your body. Oh, right. it, it, it make you look sick, it eat you up, you yeah. feel what I'm saying? My mother was a really shapely woman, beautiful long hair, all that, like, she's a beautiful woman. But after her getting high for so long, real skinny, real sick, her skin was bad, her hair was bad, like, she ain't look like... No lead, you feel what I'm saying? So she come out, and I'm like, Mom, we gotta go. So, at the time, I had just realized my mother had a stomach. She was pregnant, too. Hmm. So that's why she ran off. So they put my mother in the car. He's like, no, no, you gotta go. When they put her in the car, I'm driving up West, um, West North Avenue to get close to Copper. My mother said, <laughs> Wesley, give me a blast. Um, no, Wesley, give me $50 so I can get a blast. I'm like, mine ain't giving you no money. Come on, we gotta go. Sister in the hospital. She like, give me, boy, give me $50. I'm like, mom, no. In a moving car. Coming up West North Avenue. It wasn't going too fast because it's a main street, but I'm moving, you know? Right. My mother jumped out the moving car, hit the ground, roll a little bit, get up, dip off on me. Because I wouldn't give her money to get her fixed. So when you ask me what was a changing moment in my life, that was like a breaking moment and a rebuilding moment at the same time. Shit broke me, man. I'm gonna say it crushed you. It crushed me, bro. I sat there, West North Avenue on the side of the road for about four hours, couldn't move, crying. Because I had just finished fighting three dudes. My mother in the hospital, I'm sorry, my sister in the hospital. My mother sick, getting high. I just realized she had a stomach. I don't give her money for the drugs. She get out, gonna move my car, fall, get up, and break out. I'm done emotionally. I'm done. Right. Even talking about it right now, it's yeah, like that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm done. So I pulled over for like four hours, bro. I couldn't move. And at that moment, I realized, like, yo, this shit fucked up out here. Like, and I just was looking at the neighborhood, I was looking at the community. And again, if you're from Baltimore, or if you're not from Baltimore, if you come to Baltimore, you visit Baltimore, and you see some of these areas and conditions of how we grow up and where we grow up, and blocks that look like a band house, a band house, a band house, a band house, somebody owned this one, another band house, another band house. Yo, we living in that shit. We growing up like that. As kids, we grow up seeing that. Till we become adults, and we normalize it like it's okay to live that way. And it's not. So for me, growing up like that, and just looking at it, seeing it, Saying what my mother going through, saying what my siblings going through, knowing the childhood I done been through, I done been shot, stabbed in my right hand, like I'm from the street, bro. You Set know what I'm saying? So I'm I'm sitting there, shit eating me up. Yeah. And I emotionally it just was so heavy for me, I couldn't move for hours, bro. But when I when I left that space, I was like, I can never be a part of this type of lifestyle and this realm. In this condition no more in a way of participating in it. I need to be a participant in a way of uplifting it, motivating it, helping it, supporting it, trying to help heal some of it, building the minds, healing some hearts. Like that's what that's what I took on as a persona, right? Because my whole life was on some negative right. and some traumatic and abusive and all that. So I had to really change, bro. So when you ask me that self, even to this moment, bro, you know, give me a little chills because I get emotional about it, because that's my real life, bro. So, and that's a real experiment. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting over there now with my emotions because, you know, even though I haven't been through it in that way, like I said, just not having a mother around and then having to see your mother sit in that, in that, that toxicity of, of all of these decisions, you know what I'm saying? It can be tough. But uh, we definitely wanted to, if you want to get more into this story, that's what the book is for. He's giving you small excerpts from the book, but as you can see, is jam-packed with deep stories like that. So definitely, how can they purchase the book? 
You can find my book on Amazon. Um, again, just uh, look up Dear Nolita, D-E-A-R-N-O-L-I-T-A. If you put that in, it'll come up. Um, last time I checked, it was still at five stars, but I'm a five star rated writer. <laughs> that matters to me because I'm from stars, the hood, baby. I'm the street, I'm from the block, I'm from the mud. So to be able to produce a book that is rated five stars means a lot to me. But you can also look up my website, uh, WesleyHawkins.org, and on my website, you'll be able to purchase. But if you see me locally anywhere, I normally have them in a the trunk. Because I be booming them out the trunk, how they used to do back in the day when they used to move the CDs. Right, so I be jamming them joints out the trunk, I bro. I did, I did so, <laughs> seriously, I just sold right. thousands of books, bro, with no major promotion, no support, no help, no sign, and none of that. On my, by myself, jamming them out the trunk, bro. Right. Anywhere I speak at, anywhere I go and reach people, I also want to be able to leave a book, regardless if it's donated or if it's purchased. Okay. I was gonna say, if y'all watched our last episode, we talked about NIL deals, and I said that like if you independent in any type of career of yours, you gotta go hard. He's the walking definition of that. Like no matter what you're doing, if it's a book that you're trying to push, start with your own money. You know what I mean? Even if eventually you want to get to that point where you sign it with, you know, a different book publishing company or whatnot, but. Sometimes you just got to get it out the trunk. I mean, we in that space and like, man, get it how you live. But uh, tell them a little bit about this next segment. All right, so that was very, very, um, once again, thank you for sharing all of that. That was as transparent as you can get. Um, I think that that's definitely going to inspire being the theme of tonight's episode is inspiration. What inspires you? I know for a fact that a lot of people that watch our show is going to see that and definitely draw inspiration from you, brother. So thank you. But next up is rapid fire questions. This is an opportunity to get a little loose, uh, be a little bit more quicker with the thought. Uh, we're going to ask you questions. Me and Sella ask you a few questions. Normally we do five a piece, six a piece, seven a piece. We'll go with the flow and uh, just keep on going. So And we try to keep the answers no longer than 10, 15 seconds. Yeah. Okay. And if it's, if it's more that you want to say, we have a little segment after this called Spin the Block, and you can elaborate on something if you like to. So, so. I'll let you go first. All right, so jumping off today's episode of Rapid Fire, my first question to you, Wesley, is name one thing, and you may have, and you may repeat an answer. Name one thing you've conquered in your life you're most proud of. Uh, my degree, uh, my associate's degree. I have a master's degree in education, but my most, uh, uh, the one I'm most proud of is my associate's because associate's degree is about to take two to two and a half at the most three years. It took me six years to get an associate's degree. So my associate's degree. Congratulations on that, brother. It. Okay, better feeling. Motivation events where you help someone or attending an event that helped you? Um, motivation events. I speak at a lot of youth detention centers. I speak at a lot of prisons, um, institutions and things like that. I spoke out um, the men's um, uh, jail out Jessup um, a few months ago, and just the reception that I got from hardcore dudes that have been there <laughs> incarcerated for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and them wanting me to come back and wanting to be a part of what I'm doing when they get released, and them writing letters and reaching out and emailing and stuff, stuff like that lets me know what I'm doing, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. So that was something that motivated me to just continue to keep going, bro. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right, you talked about being nice with your hands. Um, <laughs> if these boxes was in the same weight class, who you rocking with? Javante Davis or Bud Crawford? Because of the style, I'm going to go with um, Tank. And because of my city and where I'm from, and I know his story too, I'm going to go with Tank. Um, sure. I think Crawford nice, but I'm, I'm going to stand with my own. Yeah, I, I ain't expect nothing different. Yeah, yeah, you got to stand with the hometown. So my second question is going to be, in one word, if you had to use one word to describe the No Leader Project, what would it be? You said one word? One word. Inspirational. Right on cue. Uh, one thing you regret doing on your journey? One thing I regret doing on my journey? Um, it is one dude I fought. Um, man, this is wrong. This is one dude that I fought, and I beat him up real bad. And after I beat him up real bad, I honestly wanted us to kind of reconcile and fix that relationship because we had a, a, a cool relationship at one point in time. But he got killed. Okay. He got killed before I could, before we could patch it up. Um, so I would say during my journey, that's something that I did 
as a man that I, I honestly would take it back. Um, and before you go on to the next question, that's actually, you know, we're on a cycle to our viewers, man, especially the youngins, you know what I'm saying? We can get into a lot of quick altercations with people that could be ending or, you know, just being your feelings and might not want to talk to, to people again, but life is short, man. I think as years go by, my own personal life has been things. At one point in my life, I'm like, I'd never talk to this nigga again. And then <laughs> five years later, you know, maybe a family member died and we, or a friend that we both associated with. And right. It just hits you from a different level, so that's yeah. definitely yeah, sir. And I know it's rapid, but no. it 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 it'll hit you hard sometimes because sometimes if you just take a second to think, to breathe, and calm down, some decisions don't have to be made. Some things that we do, we can actually go about it a different way. But emotions, ego, pride, anger, frustration, peer pressure. Alcohol, whatever that might be in the way at the time can lead you to doing something that you might regret for the rest of your life. So, no, I didn't take the brother's life. No, that's not what I did. But I did fight somebody that I wish I didn't fight because not only did we fight, I, I, I did him kind of bad. And then we never got to come back from that. And then he lost his life. So now it's like I never can shake the brother's hand again. Got and he got kids and everything. I can never, you know, I know his family, you know, Feel it more than me, but I'm just saying as a man. And mad at you, man. Yeah. Gosh, and I just want to say to everybody watching, especially our youngins, mid teens, high schoolers, young adults, whatever, take from what they just said. And you, when you when you're young and you're youth, you think action is the best thing because it's gonna get you a response. Oh yeah, he ain't no sucker. What's the net? But when you get older, you'll really realize taking your time. Finding understanding and moving on is being more of a man than doing something just to get a quick response. Whatever make you a man. So I just wanted to say that. Next question for you. So where I want to go with Coming here. Final I'm, I'm gonna go here with it. More gratifying feeling. First property, like first realtor property, or first book being published. I would say my um, my first property. Okay, that's a bad and, and, and reason why <laughs> reason why I say that not even not even profit sell more so I was homeless before bro. Okay, okay. okay. You know what I'm saying? I've lived I've lived in abandoned houses before. I've lived on the street. I've been a foster kid. So being able to have and then what makes it more heartfelt for me is the first property I ever purchased was actually in the same hood that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I promised to myself and my mother that. My mother lost our house when we was living down the hill because of her addiction. So I promised to myself that once I become financially stable, I'm going to be an investor or a homeowner always in the hood and neighborhood that I come from. So I own, I own uh, over four properties um, in, that, in that area where I come from, and I rent them out to people who need affordable um, housing. That's no small feat, my brother. So you can ask one more, or when I can ask one more, you can finish it with yours if you like. Alright, uh, let's see, I got one for you. You know about two or three weeks ago that list popped out there where they was talking about the women and they made the list of all the places they wouldn't go on the first date. <laughs> so this one for the fellas. Name two places that your woman can't take you on a date. <laughs> Good question, my brother. Man, a woman can't take me on the first date. It ain't gotta be a first date, just any date, period. You can't take me on a date. She, oh, that's a good one. Man. That's a great question. Yeah, cause I, I'm not, I'm not like, all right, I'm, I'm not like, um, I know my rule forms. <laughs> I'm not like a know. real high, like, oh, you got, you know, do all this a fantastic. I think the thought matters to me, but somewhere, just you know, to answer the question, I will say, um, uh, I'm not a fan of. Um, I think it's called Red Rob. I'm, I'm not a fan of Red Rob. Red Rob and catching strays. And, <laughs> and um, and um, I'm not a fan of the all you can eat joints like that all too I'm much. Like, you know, I, I grew, you know, I grew up on them, but like I'm different now because the sanitary, like gotcha. all just mad people just you know what I'm so saying. More like, like Golden Corral. Yeah, or like Golden Corral. Go, go 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 I'm taking the Golden Corral. That's hilarious. Yeah, to my father because that's the first place he tried to take us <laughs> and my siblings. We Ooh. don't like that shit. <laughs> We appreciate the Justin no, on no, no, no. <laughs> I don't want to go to the Golden Corrals. Uh, uh, I think that's the perfect way to end right there.
rapid fire questions. You did great. That was an amazing uh, question, man. We appreciate you. So at this point, we only got three more spots with you there pretty quick. I feel like you've already done it. So the first one is spin the block. Is there anything that we just asked you on rapid fire or anything that you touched on with your projects or your nonprofits that you would like to uh, spin a block on and just add something? Something that you may feel like you rushed the story or anything else that you would like to um, elaborate on? Um, probably two, two different things. Really quick, cause I, I like to put this out there for the audience that I speak to, and you know when I'm putting the message out there. A lot of the times, life is about being resilient, and what I mean about that is, no matter how challenging it is, do not give up on the things that you want. I come from not being able to read, write, and count. I come from being full grade levels behind. I come from not being able supposed to graduate in high school. I wasn't accepted into no colleges. I was really good in sports, but my grades and my uh, G my GPA and my test scores was extremely low. I sit in front of you with a master's degree in education. I have a um, I'm part of the National Society of Honors of Leadership and Success. My GPA from my undergrad was a 3.7. My GPA from my master's was a 3.8. Yeah. I speak that because I want people to know that. Even though I come from those circumstances, I had to put that hard work in. And I had to realize, yo, if you want more, you got to be able to sit down and, and focus on what you want. Because nobody going to give you nothing. You got to get up there and go get it. So I, I put an emphasis on this, that I didn't get proper education in elementary, middle, or high school. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. I got my foundation of education from a community college. Gotcha. So when it, when I was at B Triple C for six years, it helped catch me up. Mm. Like some people be like, they would have been quit, they'd have been gave up. You kept failing that, that that many times. So in college, they got the courses that called prerequisites. I couldn't pass none of them. It took me about four years to mm. get past the prerequisites before I could even get to the main courses. So those four years, I was taking all those different maths. Science, writing class, classes all over because I kept failing and failing and failing and failing. But once I got advanced enough, once I got to the next level, it was no holding back. Gotcha. So again, I went from full grade levels behind, not being able to read, write, and count. Wasn't supposed to graduate high school, foster care, drug addict parents to a master's degree. Um, and my second piece is, not only did I, you know, write and publish this book, but it took me years to put that together. You know, something that people might not understand how challenging and tough and hard it is. In this book right here is a lot of different things that I touch on, a lot of different things that I speak on, and a lot of different things that people can relate to that happens in people's real life families, real life situations, and real life experiences that reading something like this and you hear somebody else's story. I have a lot of students or kids that be like, damn, it's ours. I ain't know that. I went through that too. Mm. So I wrote this book again to be able to motivate, inspire, and uplift people. Yeah, it gets deep. Yeah, it talks about a lot of pain, a lot of trauma, a lot of hurt. But I'm speaking on it in a way that I feel like we can be able to relate to each other and also learn from one another. So those are just two of the things that I felt like I, I wanted to spend a block on really quick. Yes, yeah, so, oh, hey, sir. No, as an author, because I, I had this as a question written down. Um, I'm almost sure you had to put yourself in a crazy mental state to to get you through this process. So if you can sum up to us from a mental and you know, yeah, mental standpoint, what was it like before writing the book, during and after? Just on your mental, like, are well, you at peace now? So before, um, I used to rap. So that's why I kept asking you. So, so you got the yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I used to rap, so that's why when I came in here, I said, who got the bars? Because I used to rap. So that's where my writing style came from. Like, even in the book, before I open up some of the chapters, is a small rap or poem on some of the pages that open up. Um, I got time, I'm going to read one real quick. Um, so on page 21, it says, drug runner and diapers, right? Drug runner and diapers. But before I even open up that chapter, I wrote... This life that I live, I was given by force. And them stripes that I wear, I was given no choice. I was five on that porch, tucking drugs in my jeans. You don't know what I know if you never seen what I seen. That was a rap. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? So I opened up the chapter just speaking on my real life. This life that I live, I was given by force. Mm -hmm. 
Them stripes that I wear, I was given no choice. See, I was five on that porch, tucked in drugs in my jeans. You don't know what I know if you ain't seen what I seen. You feel what I'm saying? So I open up speaking on stuff like that. So for me, so I opened up as a writer first because I was a rapper. I was a poet, things like that. But when I changed my mindset, and again, that's another part of my story. That was a my, part of my journey. I thought my voice was going to be used through music. That's what I thought I was going to do. But I had a lot of people that would come tell me, Shorty, you nice as shit, but you too clean, you too this, you too that. They was trying to change my image. And one thing that I don't like about the music industry is they'll put money behind you, but a yeah, lot of these sure. kids and a lot of these people, some of them not really like that. Mm -hmm. And for me, you're not about to try to make me look more street. I'm from the street, but I'm not about to put on a fake costume to look more street. You feel what I'm saying? Like, I'm born and raised that. I'm not about to rap about something that, yo, drugs just take my childhood. Right. I'm not about to rap on it as a way as like I'm glorifying it. And that was one of the things that changed my mind. I was like, all right, I'm not going to do this through music because music for me don't seem like it's the way. I got the talent and the gift, but I don't feel like that's the way. How can I do what I'm doing different? And I decided to write. So when I decided to write, I started to interview different people in my family. Because even, even though I'm the author of this book, I've interviewed other people. And what does that mean? I interviewed my grandmothers. I've interviewed cousins. I've interviewed family members. I've interviewed friends and people from my neighborhood. Why? To get a different perspective than mine so I can bring it all together so it makes sense. You feel what I'm saying? Like, I could have been a child at five, six, seven, or eight. But I was a child. Hmm. As you being an uncle or as you being a neighbor, what did you see or experience or understand about me and my family when I was seven or eight? So I got those perspectives and I took those notes. So yeah, bro, I had to lock in real heavy and just put it together and, you know, I came up with that product, man. Definitely respect the process. So to? man, honestly, man, you are an amazing, uh, not just guest, but as an individual, how thorough and transparent, as I said before, you are. Because literally the way we have it set up, spin the block, hitting gym, inspirational moment and message I feel like you just did all three at one spin so I feel like um if there's anything else that Stella has for you or anything else that you would just want to leave with our audience man for last words I feel like you checked all the boxes on what do it for the love is about we're about inspiring our audience inspiring anybody that views us to do more to not give up on yourself to believe in whatever their product is whatever their process is go through it don't Look at Instagram or look at Facebook. Don't listen to the people that don't believe in you. Follow your heart. Follow your passion. And I feel like you literally are the representation of that. So I just want to thank you for being here. If so got anything else yeah, we're just gonna before you let us go? Yeah, I was going to just echo the same thing. We appreciate having you. Um, you know, when I first met you and you briefly told me a story, I was like, I would love to have you on the yeah. show. Because, you know, even though, though we have a few small similarities growing up, I feel like you've been through so much hard cool stuff that your story can take a lot of youngest that I see on a daily basis going through some of the things that you've been through you can really help change their mindsets and I hope that's what this episode does Thanks. but closing out I would love if you can give us um, either some words of inspiration or a, couple, a hidden gem from what you do and you know bless the people with that I would say no matter who you are no matter what you're going through no matter what you've been through no matter what you are going through and experiencing right at this moment you can be great, but you actually are great, and you will be successful, but you got to put that hard work in. Nobody going to give it to you. You got to get up and go get it. And I like to put that message out there because some of us sit around and wait for things to come to us, and sometimes you'll spend a lifetime, and you'll be old and gray waiting for something to happen. You got to make that change. You got to change the mindset. You got to develop. You got to grow, and you got to evolve. Once you evolve, certain things in your life will start to become the truth, and you can actually... Um, reach higher levels of success. I want to inspire you to not wait for somebody to give you something. If you want it, get up and go get it. Go work for it. And I ain't saying go get it by taking or stealing. I mean go get it by earning it. I mean go get it by building it. I mean go get it by creating it. I mean go get it by getting up every day, molding your mind, your body, your soul, your energy to go manifest the things that you want in life. And that's the message I'll leave. And if that didn't inspire you, I don't know what will. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Wesley Hawkins. Yes, sir. Thank you, Pat. Appreciate you having me, brother. Absolutely, my G. Appreciate, Appreciate you, my boy. Man.